get started. So good morning, everybody. Can can you hear me all? Okay, great. Um, I have myself a hearing loss. So when I ask questions, I may not hear you. I'm going to ask you perhaps to repeat. So I'm Ali Fatemi. I'm a pediatric neurologist. Who, the only thing I know about are the leukodystrophies. Um, that, that's all I do for a living. Um, but um, um been doing this for many years. My first time at this meeting was back in 2001. Um, and um, so uh, most of my own personal work focuses on adrenal leukodystrophy and uh, more recently on another rare disease called LBSL. But in our clinical program, we see, of course, all other leukodystrophies as well. Um, and so this lecture is intended for those people who are here basically for the first time who just want to know the very, very basics of what do we talk about when we say leukodystrophy, white matter, oligodendrocytes. So I'm not going to talk about any particular disease. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you just a, a layman's person overview of neuroscience, basic neuroscience, not cognitive neuroscience, for maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes max, and then use the rest of the hour for you to ask me questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you whom to ask. Uh, so that will be my job. Um, but uh, I imagine this is the right group of people. So I just want to make sure we are like at the same. I don't want to have leukodystrophy experts here. Uh, I know one in the back of the room, but I think she's just uh, uh, spying on me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, anyway, so so when we talk about disease, we need to always first know what where we start at. What is the normal sort of situation here. And um, basically we are talking about diseases of the nervous system and we break down the nervous system in essentially two parts, the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is the peripheral nerves. It's the nerves that go out to your hands and fingers and your legs and to your heart and to your abdomen and to your guts um, and to your blood vessels. That's all called the peripheral nervous system. And then there is the central nervous system. That's the, the master controller. That's your brain and your spinal cord. And then many times people forget about the spinal cord, but the spinal cord is a critical bridge between the brain and the rest of your body. If you don't have a spinal cord, your brain can't uh, basically regulate anything. It needs your spinal cord. So as you can see here, the, the brain is sitting here inside the skull. And then you have the spinal cord that is this long, thin thing. It's very tiny, actually. It's just about the size of my thumb. And it carries millions of neurons that are fibers that are going down and up along the spinal cord to bring the signal into the brain or bring the signal from the brain to the periphery. And, um, and um, so when you see here the spinal cord, there is... There are these roots, uh, they're called nerve roots. That's where sort of the signals from the spinal cord go out to the periphery, to your fingers. And then there are signals that come from your fingers and toes that go from the back into the spinal cord and then go up the brain. When we look at the brain, the brain is roughly broken down in three pieces. Um, and that's just anatomically when we look at a brain tissue. And that, these structures exist evolutionary wise across all the way down. You can go to zebrafish and they still have these big three pieces of brain. Okay. The one thing that makes us human and distinguishes us from every other animal is that the forebrain, the cerebrum, is by far the largest structure and the most complex structure that we know of in the universe so far. Um, and so we have the forebrain. That's where a lot of things happen. We have the cerebellum, and the cerebellum is the hindbrain. It's this structure here, and the cerebellum is basically a calculator. It's truly a machine. You know, when we talk about the brain being a complex computer machine, that would be probably the case when you think about the cerebellum, because it's a very linearly built structure where there are these logics where a signal comes in and it switches on and off and goes to the next and gets amplified or decreased. Um, the forebrain is is way more complex, and and I think there are very few people who believe that a computer will ever be able to match the forebrain. And then we have the brain stem, which is sort of that structure here. And the brain stem is essentially again a bridge between the forebrain and the hindbrain and the spinal cord. So there is a lot of structures in the brain stem that are that is a very tiny amount of space 
And so every little piece of space there really, really matters. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you have a tiny stroke in an area in the brainstem, you might lose your ability to talk. If you have a tiny stroke in the brainstem, you might not be able to swallow because a lot of the things have to go through the brainstem. And so it's very critical. So let's zoom in at the forebrain. And so here is the forebrain again. And let's take a cut through it somewhere in the middle so that we start to think about white matter. When we say white matter, what does that actually mean? Because we look at histories of white matter diseases. So when you look here at the forebrain, now cut, so it's like a slice this way and you're looking at it from the front. You can see here, it has two hemispheres, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Well, anatomically, that's how we look at things. Even though I'm showing it to you the reverse, that's how we think about it. And you see there is this, this structure here that's kind of dark cream or we call that gray. And then there's the structure that's kind of white, right? And so the white is the white matter. The gray is called the gray matter. And so in a nutshell, the majority of our functions as human are sitting in the gray matter. The gray matter is where all the nerve cells are sitting. There are billions of them, about 75 billion cells sitting in every person's brain. And they are highly connected and they are the master of everything. And um, they need to communicate with each other. And so they have cables that come out from them, we call them axons, that go from one nerve cell all the way to another nerve cell and bind and innervate another nerve cell. All the signaling is happening at an electrical level, but then there is also chemical, many chemicals that mediate this electrical signaling and regulate the electrical signaling. And then we have what we call deeper brain structures, and that matters to some of the leukodystrophies, for example, HABC or TOP B4, um, is a disease where we have, um, in, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, where, where we have basically involvement of the of the basal ganglia. So it's atrophy of the basal ganglia and cerebellum, right? So HABC, um, so hypo, hypomyelination atrophy of basal ganglia and cerebellum. And remember, this is the cerebellum, the hindbrain here. And so these gray matter structures that are deep here, these are what we call the, the old gray matter structures, the deep gray matter structures. These are evolutionary preserved. So when you go into a mouse brain, they have these and their, their, their mouse's um, deep gray matter structures is almost as complex as a human. But of course, what the mouse is missing is this vast amount of neurons sitting here these nerve cells sitting here on the surface of our brain. And we have all these brain folds because that, mag, you know, we can, if you can unfold the brain, it becomes much bigger. We have the folds to maximize the space used by these nerve cells. And so the white matter is essentially the part that connects all these nerve cells with each other. And the reason it's white is because it has these nerve cells. So these are the nerve cells, the yellow ones. And they have these cables, as I talked about, that go to another nerve cell and with another nerve cell. Some of these cables can be up to like six foot tall. And so why do I say that? So think about my brain right now, I'm six foot, right? So I have a nerve cell sitting right here in my motor cortex. And that brain signal, actually it's on this side, is telling me right now to move my right hand up and point at my head here, right? And it's also telling my right foot that I am standing here and, and, and innervating those nerve cells, uh, the, the, the muscles in my, through the nerve cells. Now, if I'm six foot, that nerve that is going down there is six foot long, right? Because it has to make its way down. Now, there is a switch in the spinal cord, so I'm, che I'm cheating here a little bit. So there's, there's actually one that goes about till here, it's about four feet, and then another one, like say three feet that goes down. But there are some nerve cells, for example, that take the signal from your toe all the way up to your brain. And those are indeed the longest nerve cells. They're called the dorsal root ganglia cells. And so for these long cables to be able to conduct electrical signal, they need to be protected and they need to be insulated and they need to be nutritionally supported because they're very long. They're, I mean, you think about it, these nerve cells are only tiny, tiny. You know, they are, they are a few microns in size. And they have these cables that's, that if you think about it, that's like having a cable going from New York City they have a house in New York City, that's the center of the cell, and the cable that may go all the way across the ocean to the other side. And so in order for this to work, they need to be insulated, and they're insulated by a layer of fat that is built by another cell type called the oligodendrocyte. And the oligodendrocytes build this so-called myelin sheet, and we talk about it in a second a little more, 
So that's the way that works is that you have here the raw cables, and this is in a developing brain. So we have a fetus, for example, that's about, you know, about to be born. And at that time, in a newborn baby, many of our nerve cells don't yet have this insulation because babies don't do much yet, right? And so they don't think much, at least. They do move, so they actually have insulation already for the fibers that are responsible for movements, but they don't have the insulation for the fibers that are responsible for them to think about you know, their taxes. Um, and so this cable here is a nerve cable, the axon, and then the oligodendrocyte cell first comes along and this cable gives it chemical signaling saying, I need to be insulated. Send me a signal, send me a signal. And, and so it releases these chemicals, the oligodendrocytes receive that, receive that chemical. And like I said, the neurons are the masters. They are the master regulators. They, they dominate everything. So they tell the oligodendrocytes come and insulate me. And over the course of the first couple of years in life, most axons become insulated by this fat layer that we then call myelin, okay? So this is actually a membrane double layer of a, of a cell that just folds itself into this sheet like a spiral. And it can become many, many layers um, of, of, of fat that then insulates the cell. And there are spaces in between as you can see, because there are different oligodendrocytes that insulate different regions. And consequently, you will have these nodes of lack of insulation, and that accelerates the electrical signaling conduction. So these spaces in between, the, the, we call them the, the, the nodes, on Ravian nodes in, um, on oligodendrocytes that are wrapping these axons, and those areas that, that are not insulated, they are electrically charged, and that electrical signal jumps from one layer to the other, and so that way you can you can conduct electrical signal. So that's one of the primary roles of oligodendrocytes, as far as we know today, is to build this insulation layer to enhance conduction speed to protect neurons. We also now know in the last ten years that the, these 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 cells actually do a lot more than that. Like I said, those those super long nerve cells, they actually get nutrition from the oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes release certain metabolites that are then transported into the axon and then are metabolized there to make sugar so that there is local energy production in these long cables along the route. And then um, there are other cells here. Uh, so let's look at the other cells here that we call so we call the glia we call the nerve the nerve cells neurons and then we call the oligodendrocytes the astrocytes and the microglia the the so-called glial cells, and the idea was that these are supporting cells. Although the more we learn, it seems like they, some of them have a pretty important regulatory roles as well. So the next type of cell I want to talk about is astrocyte, and I'm I'm sorry it's getting too deep, but I think you need to have that basis again. That I want to give you that basis so that when we talk about diseases, we know this is this type of. Uh, abnormality, because it matters how we're going to approach them from a therapy perspective. So these cells called astrocytes, they're master regulator of trying to decide what gets into the brain, okay? So there is something called the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is extremely important. Otherwise, when you have a shot of tequila, you might not last long. Now, tequila makes it to the brain, but um, but still, it's regulated how much of it gets into the brain. And, and so the body, the brain is very tight on controlling what goes in, what goes out, how much electrolytes go in, how much sugar goes in, how much amino acids go in, how much fats goes in and out. And that's done by these astrocytes. What they do is on one end, they connect to the neurons and they, they bring stuff into the neurons, you can see here. On the other end, these astrocytes go and wrap around blood vessels. And at this astrocytic footage here, so the feet of the astrocytes here that are sitting on these blood vessels, they have hundreds, if not thousands of channels sitting on them. And these channels basically determine and regulate what is going in and out of the brain. And that's critical, for example, for a group of diseases. Uh, there's one particular called the um, MLC, uh, which is megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with cysts, subcortical cysts. That's a disease where there is a problem with one of these channels. And so they're, they're, as a consequence of that, we get uh, an, an imbalance in the homeostasis of, of water, how much water gets into the, play, uh, into the brain and, and how many electrolytes get into the brain. Um, the astrocytes also do a lot of other things. They clean up mess. They take stuff back from the neurons, metabolize them, send them back. They are basically they're basically the the scut workers. They do all the daytime activities. Um, 
and, and nighttime activities. Um, so then there is um, microglia. Microglia are the police officers in the brain, okay? So what the, the, the microglia do is they basically look around. They do a lot of things. One of the things they do is they look around and see if you have a virus or a bacteria and they attack it. So that would be a typical inflammatory response against invaders into the brain. The other thing they do is also they look around for debris. The brain is very active. It's doing a lot of stuff. It's producing a lot of stuff. It needs to be constantly cleaned up. And the astrocytes and microglia are responsible for doing that. They can also go in and just pick up dying cells and, and metabolize them and get rid of them. You know, so they're basically police officers and street cleaners in the brain. Um, and so any of these cell types can be a target of a disease, unfortunately. And so as we are learning more and more about the brain, we are now realizing that there are certain brain diseases, certain leukodystrophies that are primarily, for example, oligodendrocytes. And so in the old days, we thought all brain diseases that are leukodystrophies are oligodendrocyte diseases. We have learned since that it's not at all the case. There are many diseases where the oligodendrocytes are perfectly fine, but you still get demyelination because you have a problem with your microglia or you have a problem with your astrocytes or the nerve cells themselves. And so... How do we deal with this from a classification perspective? Before we go there, one important aspect is to think about the developing brain. So as you know, many of the leukodystrophies are primarily childhood diseases. That's not the case for all. Leukodystrophy can affect at any time, at any age, actually. But many of them are childhood onset diseases. And the reason that's important is because the brain is actually not myelinated when we are born. So here you see uh, an, a, a sort of an adult-sized brain 72 months, so that's a five-year-old child. And you see, this looks very much, this is an MRI of the brain. And this looks very much like I picked the picture I showed you. You see the gray matter sitting on the top and you see the white matter here and it's nice and white. And that's, that's the normal white matter signal that we are having on a so-called T1 MRI. I'm not gonna get into that technical detail. But the one thing I'm pointing out with this picture is that if you go younger and younger and younger and you look at say a four months old brain, you see that the vast area of the brains, the vast areas of the brain don't have yet white matter. They, I mean, they have white matter, but it's not myelinated. They don't have myelin yet. There's only some structures that are building myelin. So this process is happening really, if you can compare that to that and to that, you see that the vast majority of this myelination process is actually happening within the first year of life. So the first year of life is where the brain is really busy. It's building billions of connections. Remember, you have 70 billion neurons. Each of them can build up to 10,000 connections with each other. So it's the number of connections you can have is just staggering. And all of those fibers get myelinated, right? And that's all happening mostly in the first year to two years of life. And then actually what happens is that we have the most number of connections between our nerve cells around two years of life. And then after that, the brain starts pruning and saying, okay, now we're going to find, you know, that's the learning process, right? So the brain is actually built in. You know, many people think of a newborn as a, what we call in science, a tabula rasa, an empty plate. Their brain is empty. There's nothing in there. That's not true. Actually, by the time we are two, we have more connections than as an adult. And the learning process is actually a pruning process where then you build back and say, okay, we have all these different maps of how the world can look like. And let's, let's, define the ones that are actually mattering to me. And so that's the learning process where you prune and build down connections. And so um, um, these processes are really mostly happening within the first few years of life. And so anything that goes wrong with that can result in, in a brain disease. And so now finally coming to, okay, we're here to talk about leukodystrophies. What are leukodystrophies? And people have been going around the definitions because um, because many times the original leuco means white and dystrophy means something wrong. So basically in the old days, we thought, oh, well, if you have a white matter disease, um, then it must be a, a myelin disorder. So we used to call them myelin disorders and we used to call them demyelinating disorders. Then we learned that, no, there are other forms of abnormal myelin. And there has been many definitions going around and we're actually as we speak constantly, it's sort of changing that because the more we learn about these molecular mechanisms and these cellular mechanisms, the more we're trying to fine tune and categorize these diseases based on that. But what we use in the clinic the most still is we use the MRI as a guidance. And when we look at the MRI, we roughly break down leukodystrophies as those that are hypomyelinating and those that are demyelinating. But one important aspect is that we call them heritable disorders. So the idea is that these are all genetic diseases. These are diseases that are happening due to changes in our gene 
and they may be new in the person. So when you say a genetic disease, it doesn't mean that you inherited it always from your family, right? So many times that's the case because each normal person walking around, each normal person, okay, has hundreds if not thousands of what we call gene mutations or variants. It's just that most of the time they don't result in a disease. And sometimes what you need is to have two people to have a child together who have each one bad copy and just by the rare chance that those two make are in the same gene is when you end up having a disease. But there are also leukodystrophies that are when we call the de novo, meaning that that gene change just happened in that one individual. Somebody always has to start a, what we call a founder, founder sort of mutation. And, and so, but they can again be clinically either hypomyelinating or demyelinating. Now, what does that mean? So demyelination means that you build this myelin layer and then it gets degraded. And so if you think about what I just said, myelination happening mostly through the first two years of life, most of it in the first two years of life, demyelinating diseases usually are diseases that happen usually, not always, a little later, right? So they're usually childhood onset or even adult onset diseases. Hypomyelination is sort of by definition a disease where myelin never develops correctly. And so most of the time, hypomyelinating diseases can present very early in life. And sometimes they're even present at birth. Now, there are unfortunately some demyelinating diseases that happen even even at birth. That's the very early myelinating structures that already get demyelinated. For example, infantile onset Crabbe disease, the early infantile form, we now think that that disease is starting in utero, in, in the womb. Before the baby is even born, there's already demyelination happening. And so um, in general, I want to just make some general comments because again, we could talk about, there's now over 50 of these leukodystrophies. Depending on what you define a leukodystrophy, you could go up to 85, if not 90. And we, we still have about 20% of all the cases where we know based on the imaging and the history, this patient has a leukodystrophy, but we can't find out exactly what is the genetic abnormality in those individuals. But if you want to roughly sort of classify how do these diseases look like, hypomyelinating diseases are, um, again, there's an increasing number of genes that are constantly sort of being identified as a cause. They are usually progressive, meaning the patients tend to get a little worse over time, although the MRI really doesn't show myelin, right? But the reason they can still clinically get worse is often because they, for example, are already very uh, much having abnormal muscle tone. And so if you, for example, have spasticity over years, it just starts getting more and more stiff in your legs and arms. So you, you, get, you get stiffer. And that's not necessarily a piece of the brain getting worse, but that's just a consequence of long-lasting spasticity. But there are some of these hypomyelinations where actually the patients do get worse. Um, so, for example, um, there are some of these that are called presenting primarily with what we call ataxia, gait imbalance, and that can actually be progressively getting worse over the first usually 10 years of life or so. Many times they present at birth, and if they present at birth, they're babies who have abnormal eye movements. We call them nystagmus, so they have is sort of bouncing eye movements, usually a vertical nystagmus. They have low muscle tone. And if they do learn to sit and walk, they have imbalance of their gait. And so we call that ataxia. Um, sometimes these kids still look normal at birth and don't present until later. And then so that's, that's the interesting piece on this is that as we're learning more and more about genetics and do more genetic testing, we're learning more and more different variations of the same disease. So for example, Pelletius Merzbacher disease, which is thought to be the most common hypomyelinating leukodystrophy, can present at birth with exactly this picture. Nystagmus, very low muscle tone, those babies are not feeding, they have no tone, they're floppy babies, and uh, they have abnormal eye movements. They can present that way, but they, we have also patients with, uh, with uh, Pelletius Merzbacher disease who look sort of the good for the first year or two of life. And then we notice they're really kind of delayed and they have spasticity and they get seizures. And then sort of a, sometimes they get misdiagnosed, have cerebral palsy, and then don't get even diagnosed until like teenage years at times. Uh, it really depends on the doctor. Um, so this is sort of the hypomyelinating leukodystrophies. And then there are demyelinating leukodystrophies. Um, the, they sort of present in three forms, and um, one is the infantile forms, uh, 
Uh, examples of that are Crabbe leukodystrophy, metachromatic leukodystrophy, Alexander disease, Canavan disease. So these are different diseases that are um, demyelinating diseases where the, the, the babies often start presenting within the first few months of life. Now, in the most severe cases, they can present within the first few weeks of life. Like in Crabbe, early infantile, we have kids who are already abnormal at around six weeks of life. You examine them and you already see clearly abnormalities there neurologically. Um, others don't present until like eight to nine or sometimes 15 months or 18 months of age. They often have seizures and they often have a lot of delays. And, and several of these are now, the, the, the diseases that I actually all mentioned are all either in clinical trial already or already have an approved therapeutic. So discovering these early is critical and I'm a big advocate of newborn screening, even if our treatments are not perfect, because I, I just don't think like most people who do newborn screening. Um, and I think there are others who join me in that. Um, then there is the juvenile forms of the disease, which are basically kids who look normal at birth, and they look normal in the first few years of life. They might be smart kids, they might be playing karate, basketball, baseball, and at some point during school years typically start presenting with symptoms. Usually the symptoms initially are subtle, they become hyperactive, they become inattentive, they start misbehaving, and you feel like, oh, that must be because they're not in second grade. And then you start noticing them having abnormal gait, uh, abnormal vision often, they usually lose hearing, um, and then lose eventually most functions if you don't catch them early enough. Um, and then there is the adult forms. And the more we study, the more we are seeing now patients with adult forms. And I'm coming almost to a point where I'm wondering whether there is more patients with adult leukodystrophies than kids with leukodystrophies. Our clinic is biased towards the adults. I don't know how, because I'm a pediatric neurologist. I was never planning to see adults. And somehow we have about 80% of our patients currently being adults. Um, and so in adults, it really depends on the disease, but many times their primary presentation is psychiatric. These are patients who end up in the emergency room because they have delusions, they have paranoia, they have hallucinations, or, or they have severe anxiety and, and, and those type of symptoms. And somebody finally decides, oh, let's get an MRI. And then we see, oh, they have metachromatic leukodystrophy, like this, this friend of mine. Uh, he presented at age 14, 15 with severe anxiety. At age 17, ended up in a psychiatric inpatient unit for having hallucinations. He's very open about it, so I'm not, I can't tell you about Craig. Um, and then finally, I think around age 17, 18, he got an MRI, and it turned out he had, he had metachromatic leukodystrophy. At that time, he had no neurological signs. It was all psychiatric. Now he's in his mid-20s and is, is currently using a wheelchair. He's going around the country giving lectures to psychiatrists why they should not forget about leukodystrophies. Yeah, so um, moving on, this might be my last slide. Oh, yeah. I just want to finish up this sort of neuroscience lecture by talking about why does it matter what I mentioned. So the more we learn about these diseases, the more we see that there are themes. As I mentioned earlier, there are diseases that are primarily oligodendrocyte diseases. Um, there are diseases where there are all these genes. You see all these different genes here. These are all genes associated currently with the leukodystrophy. And you can see that uh, some, of these, um, some of these genes are important functions are primarily in this cells, or some of the genes are important functions primarily in this cells. There's also many genes that affect multiple cells at the same time. And typically, they're a little harder to tackle. And so this is really critical because when we think about therapy, the different approaches that we can think of. For example, um, several of the leukodystrophies, um, two that have now approved gene therapy, MLD, metachromatic leukodystrophy, and adrenal leukodystrophy, the reason they have these therapies is that we can take their bone marrow cells out of their body, their bone marrow stem cells, fix the genetic defect in those bone marrow stem cells, and then inject those cells back to the patients. Those bone marrow stem cells, they go into the brain and they become microglia. And so if it's a disease that's primarily due to microglia, you can fix that disease by doing this approach. If it's a disease that's primarily in the nerve cells, right, then you wouldn't be able to inject much of cells. You would have to figure out a different way to fix that gene. So depending on what type of cell is affected, we have different therapy strategies. For example, one of the strategies that has been touched on by 
couple of clinical trials and people are talking about it again, is directly injecting cells into the brain with the idea that there are some cells that you can make become oligodendrocytes so that if these oligodendrocytes are the primary target of the disease, let's say Pelletius Merzbacher disease, it's a disease of hypomyelinating disease where you have a gene called PLP1 that's critical in building the myelin structure and that's defective. And so if you want to treat that disease, one of the ideas is could we inject the precursors of these oligodendrocytes into a patient's brain, healthy cells, and then have them sort of remyelinate what has been not myelinated. So this is really critical, but as you can see, this is an emerging number of genes and pathways that you're starting to understand. And so um, tomorrow I'm talking a little bit about therapeutic strategies, um, just in general, you know, there's gene therapy, there is cell therapy, there's small molecule therapy, there's substrate deprivation therapy. And so um, we can talk about that tomorrow. Um, well, I'm gonna stop. Um, and just see what questions are coming and you can hit me and then Dr. Keller and Dr. Watkins will answer all of them, yeah. right? Hi. Hello? Okay. Um, so you said in hypomyelinating disorders that there aren't really imaging changes, although there are changes in behavior and functioning. Um, are there any subtle changes on imaging and more sensitive? No, no, no. So what I meant is that the imaging doesn't change over time. Okay. The imaging is very abnormal. Over no, no, no. So, that, yeah. that, so to, to be clear, in a hypomyelinating disease, what happens is because it's not myelinating, 20-year-old brain can look like a four-month-old brain, mm -hmm. like this picture here. So they just don't have any myelin. It, it looks actually worse than that because here you see there are myelin structures and in the fully hypomyelinating leukodystrophy, we see nothing, no myelin at all, which is really amazing uh, to see that. It's almost like a reversed picture of the brain. Uh, like, you know, when, what do you call those? The, the inverse films? Negatives. But Negatives, right, yeah, jeez. <laughs> Oh, it kind of stays as it was initially presenting, even though there is functional changes, correct? Yeah. So what one of the things that we notice is that when it, the, the MRI is abnormal from the get-go, but sometimes you see the patients don't look that bad and then they get worse over time. Part of it is probably felt to be um, that, you know, again, when you're born, you do little, right? <laughs> what you do is three things, right? You, you, you drink milk, you poop, <laughs> and you cry. <laughs> right. And you sleep, I guess, four things. Right. And so, so, you know, over the first three to four months, you start moving around, you know, kids start kicking around learning, and then they start, you know, grabbing objects and they start transferring objects, you know, so this is all happening. And so when you're, when you have a newborn baby, you, you may not see anything wrong with them because they're not doing much. So they don't need much myelin. Right. But so you start seeing more and more deficits in terms of their function because those things start to appear. There's also probably other things happening. Um, one of the things, for example, is depending on the disease. Uh, for example, in Pelletius Merzbacher disease, we have most of the cases, well, it used to be 80%. My guess is now it's more like 50% because we're identifying other variants. We have a, what we call a duplication of this gene called PLP1. One of the main roles of PLP1 is to build into the myelin sheet. So it's critical for that spiral formation to keep that spiral intact because it locks in the spiral with each other to get rid of another protein. What we have learned now is that if you have too much of that PLP, because it's a duplication, one of the things that can go wrong in addition to that is that that PLP might actually go and integrate it itself into other places in the cell, for example, what we call the mitochondria, and cause problems in the mitochondria. So you may have a gene mutation that results in multifaceted sort of issues, one, and one of them might be that hypomyelination, but you might still see actually patients getting worse because in addition to it causing hypomyelination, it's causing some other problems with the brain function. At the microscopic level. Yeah, at right. the molecular level. Or, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, where can we obtain the images that you've presented today? Is there a place where we can get these? That's a question for you guys. I think it's all going to be online, I hope, right? It yeah, it's all being recorded. So it's going to be on the ULF website. 
Yeah. Yeah. And you talked about uh, screening infants like ahead of time. Can you elaborate just a little bit on that? So, yeah, I got to be careful. This is getting a little political these days, right? But um, basically, the idea of newborn screening is, is a very old idea. It's been around for about 180 years. You know? So the first newborn screening test was uh, for phenylketonuria, and it was developed um, by a guy called Guthrie. And Dr. Guthrie um, developed a very simple assay where you could take a few drops of blood and a piece of paper and then you could measure the abnormality of phenylketonuria, which is phenylalanine elevation in, in that card. So it's a very, so the idea was let's develop a very cheap, very sensitive and very specific test for a disease that can be diagnosed at birth for which we have treatment and, and treating them at birth will improve their survival. And so it was really implemented as, in my opinion, as a dual thing, A, as a sort of a, to identify kids early, but also as a public health approach. So um, then many, many other diseases followed, depending on which state you live in, which is unfortunate right now because it's state dependent, right? It's it's really insane. It's like that, you know, Elisa C. always calls it like a zip code, death by zip code. Depending on if you're in the right zip, you know, zip code, you might get the right test. Um, the different different newborn screening assays developed in different states. The, the overall idea is it's it's to improve public health. Um, it's not necessarily for the one individual, but the, to decrease the burden overall. And of course, you're going to decrease the, the burden on that one individual. But um, so what it actually means is that every baby born in every state gets new one screening. And there has been a lot of issues that have come up with that. So on one hand, the costs. Second hand is what if you diagnose a disease that is not really treatable, and then now more and more, there are people who are saying, well, what if they don't want to know about it, which never made sense in my mind. But I guess, you know, there's a lot of people who don't want to know things these days. Um, and and then the, and the fourth aspect of it is that um, there are now questions about privacy issues because some parents were like, oh, we didn't know. And now you have the genetic information of my healthy child. So they think only about their child and not the, the kids that actually are affected. Again, these are all for super rare diseases, right? So the vast majority of newborn screenings, 99.9% .9 of newborn screening tests are normal, right? Um, but the idea is to identify a disease that's treatable. And so, for example, for the leukodystrophies right now, we have adrenal leukodystrophy and metachromatic leukodystrophy that have two approved gene therapies. We have Crabbe disease that has uh, essentially an accepted treatment approach with the hemo hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or core blood stem cell transplantation. And so these three diseases should be really on the newborn screening panel. Now, ALD is, um, well, when I say newborn screening panel, I need to be a little more specific there too. So there is a federal commission that reviews this from a scientific and public health perspective and makes a recommendation and so that's called the ROS panel. And so the recommendation is screen for this disease. But again, it comes down to the states and the states have to decide based on their own rules and their own budgets and their own health departments. And so even though, for example, ALD has been on the ROS panel recommended since 2016 at the federal level, and that was a lot of work. Some people in this room contributed a lot too, right? <laughs> um, um, there are still, I think, only 30, well, it keeps increasing every week, but it's somewhere around 35 states right now that are screening and that 15 says I'm not screening for it, right? Um, and um, and so for MLD, there's no newborn screening yet. We're working on it. The assay is a little more difficult, but it's, it's, it's now at the stage where it's being proposed again to the federal level. For CRAB A, many states started screening already about a decade ago, more than a decade ago, almost two decades ago now. Um, and and very recently was reviewed by Rusp. It's still, I think, not signed off by the healthcare secretary, but it's going to be probably within a few weeks. And so, unfortunately, there's 50 something diseases that I just mentioned. And so, you only have three. And part of it is, again, because the whole idea is you would do that only in a treatable disorder. And there are some philosophical approaches to that because, you know, some people say, look, you know, you can treat. A certain aspect of a disease, but not the entire disease. Does that justify newborn screening or not? Um, you know, so that's where I'm saying politics is coming in because there's sometimes more opinion than people when it comes to that aspect. Sorry for the long answer. Thank you for that.
We have a question in the chat, um, the Zoom chat right now. So I'm just going to read this. Um, this woman says, uh, my son and I have a rare neurological leukodystrophy. I had no idea that I had this. I had migraines prior to pregnancy, and no one told me I had um, a leukodystrophy when I got an MRI. But my son and I have the same images, and now they tell me I have a leukodystrophy. The neuros I saw never felt it was more than migraines and nothing serious. Now my son has this 100% disease, and I have 40%. What can people do when this happens? I don't understand why my disease wasn't caught by images prior to my son's birth. All I was told was that it was a white matter disease unspecified. How can we advocate for early testing? I had no idea of this prior to my son's diagnosis, um, and his started with a brain bleed. Um, I'm told from the UBTF mutation, I want to advocate for early testing. I had to fight hard for my son's genetic testing, and he didn't get one until um, he was 17, um, and the doctors are in a different state. Yeah, unfortunately, this is the, the common story, and perhaps more common than, than the, the other way around. Um, we have, I, I want to say there are about 15,000 neurologists or so in the United States. I feel like that's the number. I'm not exactly sure, but that's around the number, right? The vast majority are adult neurologists. Um, and they never train currently the, the, the neurology training in the United States and, and all other countries, by the way. So we're not behind on that. Um, does not really include neurogenetics, does not include training in genetic diseases. Um, and does not include training in leukodystrophies. So you can go through an entire training without ever really dealing with a leukodystrophy or seeing a patient. Now, you probably do see a patient, but you don't realize it because you call it something else. And so part of the challenge is that we have a common disease, right, called multiple sclerosis. And so multiple sclerosis is a common disease. A lot of people get multiple sclerosis, and multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disorder. And so a lot of times patients are given that diagnosis even though it's a leukodystrophy, especially the adult onset forms. There is all these misperceptions. They may have heard about leukodystrophies in their residency, but they heard it as a pediatric disease. And when they see a 63-year-old or a 28-year-old, they won't think about a leukodystrophy because they're like, no, no, that's pediatrics. That's why I'm saying we're really having to change that curriculum, changing that mindset. The other piece is that as we are doing more and more MRIs in normal aging people. And as people are aging more and more, what we're realizing is that normal people's white matter becomes abnormal when they get older. Um, somewhere in your 60s, most people start having white matter changes. Normal, healthy, highly intelligent chess players, right? CEOs of companies, they will start having white matter changes. That doesn't mean anything necessarily to them. Uh, there are some correlations with, with cognitive function decline in very significant white matter disease. That is what we call nonspecific white matter changes. And so if you image old people, you will see white matter changes that we call nonspecific. So that's why most likely if you are now a 25-year-old who's pregnant, who got an MRI and have similar changes, the radiologist is going to just call it nonspecific white matter changes because that's what they're used to because they're imaging all these older people, right? So, so it's, it's really a need to change the mindset because what we're learning now is that in these adult onset leukodystrophies, the difference between the adult and the pediatric often is that in the pediatric leukodystrophies, we often have a very distinct MRI finding. So I don't know if sure many of you have heard the name Mario van der Knapp. Professor Van der Kamp, she's here right now. What she did when she was a student still is she generated this massive spreadsheet just documenting the abnormal regions of white matter in every single patient she saw. And then she started seeing these patterns. Oh, these seven patients have these structures that are abnormal. These five patients have this. And then it turns out all of these ended up being distinct genetic diseases. That's how vanishing white matter disease came along. That's how MLC came along. That's how LBSL came along. All of these terms are because they have distinct MRI patterns. In the adult world, it's not like that at all. And in fact, we can see, for example, taking vanishing white matter disease. This is a disease that we thought was a pediatric disease. And in the pediatric form, it's called vanishing white matter because you see the white matter vanish away. It's a very distinct MRI finding. We do something called spectroscopy. We see that there's basically brain being replaced with fluid. In adults, it can look exactly like what we call a nonspecific white matter change. And so it makes it really tricky. And, and, and we often have patients in our clinic where we are not sure. We have patients that have these changes and they are like people in their 50s and 60s. 
and somebody thought of a local dystrophy, so they're like, go see the expert. And even I look at them, I'm like, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. And so we end up often doing genetic testing to see if it is genetic or not. The problem is that our testing is not super great. So if you have a normal test, that doesn't necessarily rule out a genetic disease. So on this, this is the complicated issue. There's like all these issues that often lead to getting a delayed diagnosis. So I'm sorry to hear that. Hi. Um, so uh, following up on what you were just saying, I mean, the adult MRIs are looking different from the childhood MRIs. Have you, has anybody studied uh, comparing and contrasting with, say, MRIs of people with dementia or Alzheimer's? And also you had mentioned uh, MS, which... Mm -hmm in adults, leukodystrophies are often, and I think also ALS, mm -hmm. some people, and those are much more common, mm -hmm. but do those have an brain impact that shows up on the MRIs too, that contrasts or compares with okay. leukodystrophy MRIs? So yes and no. So okay. it depends, I guess. Yeah. So, so for example, in MS, that's what I was just saying. So in uh, multiple sclerosis, um, MRI changes can very much look like some of the adult onset leukodystrophies, or I would say maybe vice versa. Adult onset leukodystrophies, for example, there's a disease called ALSP. Um, ALSP on MRI can look a lot like multiple sclerosis at first, and people get often misdiagnosed. Um, so that's 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 something it, you know that's actually usually the pattern is they end up in a multiple sclerosis clinic until they end up finally. Uh, seeing somebody because there's like, oh, hold on, my sister has the same. So now you got two family members with multiple sclerosis, and it turns out, well, that's probably not, not multiple sclerosis. Then it's probably genetic. In terms of dementia, the dementia MRI sometimes is normal. Many times it shows just atrophy of the brain, meaning the brain is kind of shrinking. Many times because it's older patients, they have these non-specific white matter changes. So yes, dementia can sometimes look like a leukodystrophy or vice versa too. And one of the things that we are seeing slowly now is the question whether in people with a, with a genetic disease in general of the brain, whether they are more prone of developing atrophy on white matter changes as they get older, even if it's not a leukodystrophy per se. So there are some, this is a more emerging literature now as people with various genetic diseases are aging and getting older that we're starting to see, oh, we thought this was primarily a whatever, you know, peripheral disease. Um, and now we see that now that these people are hitting their 60s and 70s because survival is getting better, we start seeing actually that they start having a secondary degeneration. They get dementia on top of what they have had already all their life. We see that the, the, mo the first disease that was known to be like that is, for example, Down syndrome. Right? We all think about Down syndrome as the kids that have Down syndrome, right? And then we learned, now this is now decades, that oh, these Down syndrome kids, they end up developing Alzheimer's in their 20s and 30s. And so now there's more and more diseases like that. So it gets, it gets complicated because we use these human-made terms, right, for complex, complex sort of clinical presentations. I hope I didn't confuse people more. Worry about that a little bit. Yeah. I confuse myself sometimes. So that's it. This is more of just kind of an open-ended question. I don't, you probably don't have the answer to this, but should we, or should the community of leukodystrophy be going to um, like multiple sclerosis clinics and educating mm -hmm. those doctors that for adult onset leukodystrophies? You're touching my nerves. Yeah. <laughs> so we had yesterday, I was just talking to uh, somebody downstairs just about that. I think part of the challenge we are having right now is that we are having more and more treatable conditions with clinical trials emerging. So treatable in the sense that there are clinical trials that we can do in patients. Now, we don't know if those therapies work yet, but we got to have the patients to test them, right? And, and if there are adult trials our biggest challenge right now is recruitment. We can't find patients for those trials because you need relatively large numbers of patients to get enrolled into trials, to be able to do statistics, to be actually able to tell if this thing working or not. Yet we can't find the patients because we're looking for adults often, 
And these adults are misdiagnosed sitting in the MS clinics and the ALS clinics and dementia clinics. And so we are really trying to scratch our heads, figuring out what to do. There is a multiple sclerosis um, related conferences. And so one of the things that I think would be very good is, for example, for ULF or other advocacy groups, especially the adult onset ones like CTX or ALSP or ADLD, to have a booth at that conference so that when the doctors go there, the MS doctors, they hear about it. Um, but again, part of the challenge is going to be that a lot of the sort of people who go to conferences are usually academic people, so they think about it anyway. Mm -hmm. It's more the community people who are in more rural areas. You know, you got some states that have, I mean, there were, there were a few states that have one or two pediatric neurologists or no pediatric neurologist in the entire state, for example, right? And so so that's part of the problem. It's just scarcity of, of experts, right? And so they tend to be aggregated at these academic institutions, but you already know it anyway. Yes, I mean, if you, you're Kennedy Krieger, we have, at the very least, six leukodystrophy neurologists, right? And sometimes we're like, oh, no, this is my patient. Oh, this is my patient, right? <laughs> so, so we have too many, uh, so... Um, but yeah, that's part of the challenge. But I do think it will be really helpful for advocacy to go and reach out to the MS community because yes, that's absolutely that's and the MS community is starting to really realize. Uh, so you know, if downstairs, for example, there's there's a meeting on ALSP. Dr. Jen Orthman Murphy is presenting. She's a neuroimmunologist. She runs an MS clinic. But she she got it. She was like in her training. She came to my clinic and she realized, oh my God, this patient of yours. I would have just called this MS. And this was somebody with uh, with uh, ADLD, and so so she now has built this population of patients with ALSP and adults, and is seeing experts. She's sort of the expert, but again, it's one in fifteen thousand, right? So it's hard to get come by. Thank you. Any other questions? have any but I think that's it then. All right. Thank you all. Thanks for coming here. <laughs>